Welcome to this Gillick Explains Finance video. This week, I want to take a look at a topic which a lot of people might think, well, not terribly important, haven't got much of it around. Why worry? Inflation. Why many savers constantly misjudge it and the price you potentially pay for doing so. Okay, so the background would be what for this one? A nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. Famous quote from Yogi Berra. And basically what he's saying there is, over time, the value of the dollar in your pocket, or the pound in your pocket, actually reduces. It's a silent problem, you don't notice it happening, but you can wake up one day and realize that your purchasing power, your ability to buy stuff, has in fact shrunk. The reason is inflation. So, there are two types of return available to savers. So, turning that into something you can use, if you're saving for the long term, you can look at nominal. And people do tend to look at nominal rates of things in general. That's the return achieved before inflation, because most savings rates are nominal rates. Earn 3%, they say. They're not taking inflation into account. You can get 8% growth, they say, not taking inflation into account. Most things that are thrown at us are not inflation adjusted. But the real, literally if you like, in your pocket return that you're making should be inflation adjusted. And the annoying thing can be sometimes you don't get quoted a post-inflation number, but you should nonetheless factor it in. Now, why this matters? Basically, inflation eats away at long-term returns. It's a silent destroyer of wealth. The effect is to reduce what's called your purchasing power over time, a grand way of saying what you can buy with the money in your pocket, if you like. And yet, as Irving Fisher noted in The Money Illusion, people prefer to think in nominal terms. So even though inflation can do a lot of damage over the long term, people still prefer to think in nominal terms. They find it easier, and I have some sympathy with why. Now, why do we ignore inflation? I think there are three reasons, basically. Number one, the rate is currently very low. So a lot of people think, well, if it's low, I can sort of forget about it, can't I? Number two, our brains suffer from an anchoring bias when it comes to looking at nominal versus real numbers. And I'll try and explain that with an example. And we struggle to think over long time periods at all, and therefore we underestimate the impact of inflation over the long term. And as a saver or investor, you've got to be thinking long term, not about tomorrow, not about the next six months, but about the next 20, 30, 40 years, potentially. So let's take these in turn, lower for longer. Well, an easy way to show you why a lot of people have forgotten about inflation is a chart like this. Bit chunky, but this is the UK CPI rate, if you like, over time from the late 1980s, we're down to a fairly low level, and it's stayed there, broadly speaking, for a while now. So a lot of people think, well, don't need to worry, inflation 1 or 2%, hardly worth bothering with. But beware of the impact of a supply shock. Now, as I make this video, we are in the throes of markets reacting to the coronavirus. And one of the reasons that is potentially dangerous is because we might get, for the first time in my lifetime, a global supply shock. What does that mean? It sounds like a, a, a terribly long-winded, scary economic phrase. It means that goods and services might temporarily, perhaps, slow down moving around the world. And if that happens, competition for those goods and services could increase. And what you might get is slower growth combined with higher prices. And that is a bit of a nightmare. And it's why central banks are probably pausing at the moment, unsure what to do next. Now, this could all blow over. Coronavirus may be literally something that just comes and goes, but that possibility of a supply shock leaves inflation in the short term on the table at least, even if we're not gonna sort of panic about rising inflation just yet. So I'll leave that thought with you. Then there's the anchoring effect. This is psychological. This is, regardless of the rate of inflation, the way we think. So, to demonstrate this, Tom and Tim both work as advisors, let's say. In a year of zero inflation, Tom is offered a pay rise of 2%. And this, by the way, is based around a famous study. It's not just my random thoughts, if you like. In a year where inflation is 4%, Tim is offered 5 So here you go. Virtually no price inflation. Tom, 2% deal on the table. Inflation is running at 4%, around double the current reported rate. Tim is offered 5%. Now, the study was all about this basically. In 1997, so going back a bit, there was a big study done about whether you'd rather be Tom or Tim. And the answer depends. If you're asked the question, who's better off in economic terms, most people went for Tom. Because they said when inflation's zero, he's getting a pay rise of 2%. That's a good pay rise in that context. 2% more than the rate at which prices are rising in general. So he will be happier versus the 1% margin that's on offer 
for Tim, if you like, 5% versus 4%. But when asked who would be happier and less likely to quit their job, people switched and said, well, that's going to be Tim because his headline pay rise rate in nominal terms is better. And people tend to think like that. They go into the end of year pay review and they want the highest number possible. They don't think about the relative gap between what they're being paid and what they've got to buy with it. And in an era of deflation, by the way, should we ever hit such a thing, Japan's skirted around deflation, in technical terms, you should be negotiating your pay cut at the end of the year as prices fall. Sounds pretty weird. It's not how most people think. Hence the logic behind Tim being happier and less likely to quit his job, even though in economic terms, Tom is better off. So the hidden long-term impact is what here? Well, basically, the rule of 72 is useful. So this is the third reason people tend to forget about inflation. The effect is hidden, if you like. The rule of 72 basically says, if you divide 72 by a prevailing inflation rate, you get the length of time it will take to halve what you can buy with your money. So at 3% inflation, 72 divided by 3 is 24. So your purchasing power halves in 24 years. Ramp up the rate at 4%, it halves in 18. And at 10%, I know we're way off that, but we've been there in the past in Venice, but we are some way off that. It takes only seven years. Now, you can't see that happening. It just happens quite silently in a sort of hidden effect as the value of your money erodes and the price of goods and services increases. Another way to see this, some of you have seen this chart before, is you start with 100 pounds in 1976. Inflation reduces it in buying power terms by the end of 2019 to way less around the, depending on which measurement you look at, around the 9 or 10p mark. So, conclusions would be what from all this? Well, basically, it's easier to think in nominal terms, but be careful. Easy isn't always best. Inflation risk is especially high in assets such as cash, where you're earning a relatively low return, and always think about that return in inflation-adjusted terms if you can, and the effect is cumulative. And this is the thing about inflation. Over a short period, it doesn't do much damage to any asset class, frankly, but over the long term, it certainly can do, because it constantly erodes at a cumulative compound effect, constantly erodes what you can buy with the same money. So there you have it, editor at killick.com with queries. And if you want to watch other videos related to this topic, killick.com forward slash learn.